Good morning. So, I'm Frank Bodin. I'm a product manager for OpenStack NAV at Red Hat. Morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Uri Tour with uh, Intel. I uh, work for the Data Center Network Solution Group, part of the Data Center Group. And uh, what Frank and I have uh, in store for you today is uh, some uh, introduction. Hopefully, the light is actually in my eyes, so I can barely see you. But uh, introduction of uh, FIDO, FDIO um, to the OpenStack community, hopefully, uh, some of you have heard about it before, and maybe some of you have not. So uh, there is lots going on in that community. We are not going to be able to cover everything over here. We wanted to give you some of the key highlights, um, explain what that technology is all about, and why and how it is relevant to the work that we are doing here in OpenStack. So we'll start with... Uh, what is FIDO, what is the community, who's in that community, how that community works. Um, Frank is going to go into some depth about the fundamentals of uh, the technology that uh, is used by uh, VPP, which is one of the projects under that bigger umbrella of uh, FDIO. We'll give you some examples of a few different projects and few different approaches how uh, this new data plane can integrate into components that supposedly are well known over here, um, specifically OpenStack Neutron and um, Open uh, Daylight and some options that are independent like uh, Open Daylight and SFC directly and we'll talk about those options. Uh, Obviously, in OpenStack community these days, uh, you cannot present anything without talking about containers. We are not going to break that tradition either and, uh, and show you how this technology or this set of technologies, I should say, um, is relevant to uh, the container uh, discussions uh, we are having. So, um, we have... Uh, ha borrowed heavily from a large set of uh, people who are working in, in this community, and we want to thank them for some of the slides that we stole with uh, pride. Uh, what is FDIO? I want to start with uh, putting things in a little bit broader context before uh, we dive in. Um, basically, as you could see, it's a high-speed programmable uh, data plane that runs on the infrastructure that we use in order to uh, fulfill what OpenStack is trying to do, what NFV is trying to do, and so on, namely on, um, on some uh, servers. Uh, you could see at the bottom the fundamental layers or services, and, and we'll touch on all of them, um, what role they are playing. The bottom layer, the I.O., is really uh, comprised of DPDK, the Data Plane uh, Developers Kit. This is a technology that has been there for, um, I believe, about uh, seven years or so. And um, this uh, group is also in transition. Uh, they are moving from an independent organization to uh, a location to be uh, advertised soon, most likely into uh, the Linux Foundation as well. But what DPDK provides here is a set of software libraries that are tightly coupled and matched to all the innovations and progression of the server architecture. And therefore, what you have is a set of primitives that would give you as close as possible to the capabilities of the underlying hardware technology. On top of that, the layer um, referred to on this slide as processing is uh, the VPP, and Frank is going to uh, cover that in detail, so I'm going to leave it uh, for later. But basically, it rides on top of uh, the DPDK. It 
utilizes capabilities in the server that supports vector processing, and it adds many other network-related uh, services and technologies, as you'll see in uh, the rest of this presentation. The other layer here, the management agent, is a capability to control all of that locally or remotely, and again, we are going to show how all, of, how all of that comes together. One option, and we are going to go much deeper into it right now, so I'm not going to take the time at this moment, is to layer that such that this server resident data plane hooks up into an SDN controller like Open Daylight, and Open Daylight has already known interfaces into OpenStack. Some innovation is happening on those interfaces in the context of FDIO, and we'll talk about that. But that is putting things in a little bit of perspective. So the takeaway, these are the layers, uh, differentiate between what FIDO as a bigger umbrella gives you and what VPP is uh, providing as a set of services, as you could read from uh, the slide, it's one of uh, the key projects. What is the community all about? What are the key tenets? Uh, what are uh, the key things that this community is uh, trying to do? And maybe the four key elements that we want to touch on today, um, you have these uh, community members, as you could see on the upper left side, uh, almost uh, these days in the industry standard tiering of uh, platinum and gold and, and, and uh, silver for a community that was established just a few months ago. Uh, very impressive acceptance by uh, the industry. And open source doesn't obviously go without a community, so, um, and community is benefiting and the project benefits significantly from the right governance. And for those of you who are familiar with uh, the Open Daylight uh, governance, and I, for one, am with the Open Daylight community for a long time, the governance structure that we have here really is uh, from the good lessons that we all learned from uh, the Open Daylight with a few announcements. And, and maybe one of them that is worth mentioning, I'll mention that on the other slides, is the concept of uh, sub-projects that uh, could individually progress and individually release, and that is something that we did here intentionally to allow um, as large diversity of communities and projects come together under this umbrella. So the good governance goes hand in hand with the fast progression of the technology and the community and with enabling innovation, and that is uh, very important. The scope, now you are familiar after the previous slide with these three layers, and you will see that actually the community not only works on the data plane itself, but also works with OpenStack, with Open Daylight, to name few other communities in order to make the data plane available to those orchestration solutions. Another element that this community brings to bear here, which uh, we believe is probably the first attempt to do something like that in the industry, is to provide um, some sort of a CI-CD environment where if you, with your project that you contributed to the community, have a new feature that enhances functionality or performance, there is a lab that is uh, running in the background and enables uh, continuous testing of that, making sure that no new feature that has been introduced um, is going to cause any slowdown of the performance. So we want to make sure that we hold uh, two flags as high as we can, not only features and functionality, but the performance aspects as well, and that is the role of uh, the CPL. That was supposed to take me to the next slide, and it does. So um, some of the projects that we have in the, in the community, starting again from the bottom, we talked about uh, that layer. 
Um, VPP, which we are going to double click on next, and, and Frank is going to cover that. Some of the projects, and due to shortage of time here this morning, we are only going to cover some of them. Uh, we will cover NSH, SFC, that uh, service uh, function chaining uh, technology, and we'll show how it works in, in this context. Uh, one, I would not say one and only, but it's an overlay uh, network engine that is based on uh, LISP technology, and it is an attempt to show better scalability uh, and ability to actually do overlays end-to-end, uh, -end, supports uh, multiple technologies. We are not going to cover that in more details, and, and you will have pointers here to the community wiki, and you could get those informations. We also have here the concept of a sandbox, which really allows the community, the developers, to play with uh, new features that they want to add in a confined environment, uh, make sure they work, and then they could uh, launch that into the rest of the project. And um, another piece that we are going to lightly uh, touch on in this presentation this morning is the Transport Layer Developer Kit. This is uh, an attempt to add a full functional TCP IP stack for those cases where such uh, processing is required. But all of the uh, processing that we do in the context of FDIO, as it is based on DPDK, is in the user space. So when we have traffic either um, emerging from the server or uh, ingress into the server, that traffic is taken out of the kernel, moved into um, the user space, and therefore one would need to have a transport layer. Uh, that transport layer for those use cases where it's required is going to be, uh, and that is the design goal, uh, to be much faster than the one uh, in the kernel. On the right side, we have a set of uh, packaging options for popular distros, and we have um, exercises like uh, the T-Rex and the uh, continuous testing and integration um, that is, is part of the project. And the last component here is, is the honeycomb. The honeycomb is that agent that resides on the server on top of the VPP layers that allows one to either manage um, that functionality on the server locally or hook it up remotely using netconf, restconf um, technologies in order to interact, for instance, with an open daylight. Um, you have more text here on, on uh, the governance. Uh, probably just going to hit a uh, few key points here. It's a fully open uh, technology. Anyone could contribute. Um, you get to a committer based on uh, merits, based on a recommendation of, uh, of uh, your friends. I uh, mentioned uh, earlier that um, we did something a little bit different here with the sub-projects, where sub-projects got much higher level of autonomy than you normally uh, find. So, so anything that is defined as a sub-project could also uh, release in, independently. And we also uh, preserve that kind of uh, coupling and decoupling of the board from the TSC. So uh, the board is focused on, on the business aspect and is not giving technical direction to the developers. The technical community interacts with the board on, on business issues, general direction, uh, but not more than that. Um, you could see some of the rather impressive activity that is happening for a community that uh, has just uh, launched a few months ago, and uh, we'll show you not only the functionality that is available today, but actually also the fact that um, this technology is getting very, very close to production and maturization on some aspects, while there is, uh, we have many plans to do uh, additional work and, and other projects, but provided some statistics for you so that you could uh, relate to this. And with this 
intro over, uh, let me hand it off to, over to Frank to cover some of the fundamentals of the technology. Thank you, Ray. So, <clears throat> what is VPP? So, uh, VPP is an, um, it's a protocol stack made of graph nodes. So, to take an example, when we have, let's say, an IPv6 packet getting in, we go into an Ethernet input, pass the header, we, that's an IPv6, so we go to the IPv6 uh, input node, then to the IPv6 lookup, you find your exit route, and then you go to the node to transmit the packet, basically. So far, nothing very new. Now, this is vector-based, so instead of going through the graph, packet by packet, you go with a bulk and 256 packet. Up to, this is a value that is a default one today. As a benefit, you will always have processing packets by 256 in a node, so your instruction cache is hot, you don't have instruction cache miss, and also all of the uh, nodes are implemented in a way that th you process the packet always two by two. So I've got a first packet, that's an IP, uh, IP header. So I'm doing the, instead of doing a lookup in the flow table, I will prefetch, uh, based on the IP address, the cell of the flow table lookup, corresponding to the flow. Then I will prefetch for the second packet, and while I'm back on the first packet, uh, the, the cell entry of the routing table is, in the pack is on the CPU cache, so I don't have a cache miss by processing the packet two by two and I'm interleaving them. So no data cache miss, no instruction cache miss, thanks to very clever prefetch and interleaving packets processing. And a quick comparison with the OVS paradigm. So we have a compiled graph when you have a, you have a bulk of packets going through uh, the graph node and exiting, while with OVS, you have a data pass and a control plane, a slow pass. So basically, with OVS, the packet gets in, and if it's in the cache, it gets out, get out very fast. If it's not in the cache, meaning that's a new flow, it gets in the control plane and go to a very, very long pass compared to the cache, and then go, you add an entry in the cache, and then you go back. So, VPP uh, has a kind of deterministic time of traversal, all packets are equal when you enter VPP. While with OVS, the difference is if you're a packet from a new, from a new flow, you're going to be much slower. Another comparison with OVS is VPP is uh, conflict. When you start VPP, all the nodes have no configuration, so an external agent has to push the configuration, and I'll come back on, on that later on. And finally, VPP has no kernel implementation counterpart. When you want to implement something in VPP, you implement it once, not twice. You don't have to implement kernel and user land. You implement a node and you're done. So it accelerates developments. In terms of portability, so um, VPP is portable on multiple architecture x86, ARM, PowerPC, and could be easily ported on other architecture. It's ported on various operating systems because it has an abstraction layer of operating system named CLIB that you have to implement for all operating systems, something very classical. In terms of NIC support, what you need is an, so what is a driver? A driver is an input node. So what are the input nodes available today? We have DPDK, TUNTAP, AF Packet, NetMap, and even legacy driver. Don't ask me why it's there. I don't, I don't think you will use them, but anyway. And last but not least, vhost user to interconnect VM to VPP. Also, you have also a shared memory implementation named SSVM plus others that will come, which is typically uh, a fast uh, shared memory that could be used between containers for VPP instances being in different containers. I'll come back on that later on. Also, VPP has some nodes. Uh, which leverage hardware uh, accelerator, like for instance for IPsec, so you go to your IPsec node and then you can offload some IPsec uh, ciphering, deciphering in hardware. And uh, you can deploy a VPP on the host, bare metal, as a vSwitch, as a router, in VM, in containers. And uh, a little trick uh, from VPP is uh, the critical, uh, for instance, the IP lookup table nodes are compiled with various uh, CPU option uh, optimization, so if your CPU is old, an old version, it will work, but if you have the latest, greatest AVX v3 uh, and uh, you have a, a, an optimized uh, lookup function, it will dynamically use it. You don't have to have a v so one VPP version can work on older and latest, greatest CPU, so that's very practical. In terms of modularity, flexibility, so first, 
it's easy to build up your graph node for your use case. So you create your stack for your, for your need. Now you can add plugins, and the plugin is often a sub-project in VPP. So a plugin is a bunch of nodes uh, that can rearrange the original graph uh, that, uh, that can be built independently of uh, VPP source tree and that can be added at runtime and of course that can extend the configuration API. So for instance, uh, NSHSFC is one of these plugins. And once again, all in user space. So it's permit to build vSwitches, vRouter, anything processing packet. So now we have nodes. We have a nice framework, but as a developer, how do I uh, debug this framework? So VPP comes with a lot of embedded uh, telemetry, so not the OpenStack telemetry. Uh, so for instance, that's an example of counter. So uh, here I've got statistic per node, and we can see per node how many calls, how many vectors, you know the vector that's uh, 256 packets, how many clocks are spent in a given node, and how many packets are. Uh, so in this example, I'm at uh, 256, meaning I was quite loaded, but not 100%. So, the, so this is a very basic uh, graph node, but when you have something complex, don't be afraid, you have the tools to debug. Something very nice, TCP dump. So I want to TCP dump in my VPP graph node. So what? So this is a, this is a real screenshot, like the previous one. So you, uh, here I'm asking to get 10 packets on VPP, and, for, and then I sh I'm showing the trace. This is something which is put in memory, so it does not affect so much the performance. So, and I've got per node a lot of, uh, depending on the, the developer node, a lot of, or a little of uh, traces. And also timestamping per node, so you can follow your packet in the graph node and identify a bottleneck, if any. So that's very handy. VPP as a vSwitch vRouter, so we are all here at OpenStack Summit and the VPP first use case, from my perspective as an OpenStack product manager at Red Hat, is a vSwitch. So, how, so first, how Neutron implements uh, uh, the Neutron implementation with VPP is based on bridges. So when you create a tenant, you create a, a kind of bridge object from, uh, from um, a VPP perspective that will interconnect all of the ports. It's very simple to understand. If you want to implement a vRouter, you will create a VRF, which is a routing table that will, you will interconnect with nodes. Uh, the configuration has to be pushed and stored by an agent because, as I said, VPP is complex. So you need to have an external agent. So that's very modular. So VPP is really modular by essence inside and also it does not want to do everything. It just do packet processing fast. Uh, one little note because that's my, uh, <laughs> that's my favorite topic, benchmarks. So most of the benchmark in the wild today are either physical to physical either uh, cross-connecting ports with VMs, which is fine, which is a good step ahead, but still not with OpenStack. So uh, just to say that most of the benchmark yeah, that you will see in the wild are not representative of an end-to-end use case with OpenStack, it does not mean that the performance will be lower. It just means that people take a shortcut to make the benchmark, and uh, we are working within OPNAV project to provide you end-to-end -end benchmark uh, with VPP and with other vSwitches with OpenStack because that's easy to cross-connect ports. But now, if you have a very complex topology uh, of graph or something, maybe the performance will collapse. So we need to benchmark the end-to-end -end use case. Also, just to say that VMs are connected via vHost user ports. And today, VPP has a specific vHost user implementation, which is in fair competition with DPDK uh, vHost user implementation and FIDO people and DPDK people are working together to take the best of both to finally come with one version. So that will converge. This is work in progress. And uh, this, so last week we, we were in, uh, in DPDK Summit and we have seen a lot of people working to improve this performance because vHost user today is a bottleneck for any vSwitch, including VPP. So, uh, Later on, you can click on this link and get a full report about VPP performance, and there is a thread on the mailing list about the performance of VPP, comparison with OVS DPDK, and 
Nobody at FIDO or OVS DPDK is afraid of the comparison. That's open source. This is a fair comparison with real, real arguments, no marketing. So today, that's number that we've seen. But once again, I said this is work in progress. We're working on the, on the benchmarks. VPP features. So you can go on the website. It will be soon updated, I guess. And uh, so you have plenty of features, more than you want, more than you want. The 16.09 bring you the latest DPDK, the next version, I guess, with rebase by heart on the latest DPDK. So VPP is always up to date regarding DPDK so far. It brings some new ACLs, which are uh, useful for security group for Neutron. A lot of enhancements that I will just keep, so I'll let you have a look by yourself. And uh, the jewel of the crown, from my perspective, as a product manager, that's their CI. FIDO has a really great CI, so name CSIT. Basically, uh, the CI includes performance tests, non-regression with these 15 tests. So every time someone tries to submit a patch, if you have a regression in performance, the patch does not pass the CI gating. So that's really cool. Also, for a given version of CSIT, of, sorry, of VPP, you have the test results available with, for all of this configuration. So you want, you want the data, you just get, it, get there. Also, you can download CSIT, install it in your lab because that's all open source. You can run the same test. All is open, no tricks. Regarding, uh, so, yeah, sorry, I've been, I've been quick because we are kind of, yeah, kind of pushed by the time. So uh, from an OpenStack integration, we have two paths. First path is ML2, direct ML2. So there is an ML2 plugin which has been pushed. So you have the link uh, to the announcement. So uh, it's based on etcd, and you have seen that uh, in the FIDO community, you have uh, Calico, which is also using etcd. So I guess this is a coincidence there. So uh, basically, you have an ML2 uh, uh, mechanical driver on the server, which is pushing via etcd the configuration to the ML2 agent that uh, store the configuration. And in terms of features, so we are not parity feature yet with, new tr with uh, OVS, but we are close. So for instance, today you can restart your VPP agent, you can restart the ML2 driver, and uh, it's supported, so I I'm fast, but uh, basically um, it it's connected to the Q rotor, the QDHCP, and uh, in terms of distribution, it's integrated in Apex Tripolo installer. So if you take Apex Tripolo installer, you can deploy the ML2 plugin end to end. And it's also included in DevStack. Uh, next item in the, in the ML2 roadmap is a security group to be fully implemented, anti-spoofing, tap as a service, and for the, the version later, VXLAN support and integration with telemetry systems. And with that, I will hand on to Uri. So that's gonna be uh, a bullet train through the next few slides uh, given time here. Uh, the other option that, that we have is uh, the fast uh, data stack. Uh, with uh, the fast dat data stack, there is a, a different uh, ML2 interaction with, uh, with uh, the Neutron um, stack, and you are utilizing the group-based policy stack all the way from um, the top into uh, open daylight in order to uh, render whatever you need on, on a server node. Um, give you um, some more detailed example of, uh, of how it works. So when Neutron uh, creates its uh, uh, post port command, which really is about adding a new port, um, the following layers that are part of the Open Daylight implementation uh, kick into, uh, into action. Uh, the northbound, which is uh, the active uh, layer over here is going to store that information in, in the neut uh, Neutron uh, data store and uh, group-based policy um, is going to be on a listen mode and it's going to catch that information that the new port is being requested to be added and it's uh, part of the nodes that it uh, covers and it's going to be, as an example, uh, a node that needs special configuration on the host, like a v, v host, that's the interface that Frank was uh, showing uh, earlier. So uh, the next 
step in the progression is, is to create a group-based policy uh, endpoint. And now we have, um, we had the policy, say the policy would be, um, in this particular example, something about let me create a VXLAN tunnel between these two endpoints. You'll see on the left side, uh, VPP1 is that case where I have a virtual machine. In the case that I have a virtual machine, I need to take two types of actions. One is the local configuration, uh, which in this particular case is about connecting a virtual machine using a vhost to uh, the vSwitch that VPP um, exposes and that's um, that error, but uh, we also need to configure the quote-unquote vSwitch in order to create the vTunnel, and that is the other set of activities. As you could see, VPP2, as an example, doesn't have a virtual machine, so one of the steps is skipped. Um, another uh, example, and again, for shortage of time, I'm not going to introduce this slide um, at depth because we want to leave a few minutes for the container as well, but um, this is... Uh, Another technology, the IETF version, uh, NSH-based, where you have service functions, as you could see over here. The key idea is that I want to direct my traffic along a graph, and I want to set my resources, size them up in an efficient way so that only the traffic that needs to hit a resource really has to hit a resource, plus adding the capability of uh, metadata, which is a standard way to allow those nodes to communicate with each other whatever information policy-based, classification-based that you accumulate, you could now uh, progress through the chain uh, with uh, the rest of uh, your traffic. Um, this is what uh, we, we support uh, over here. And um, the overall Open Daylight SFC architecture has been enhanced to include uh, the VPP uh, render that, as you saw on the previous slide, is that entity that, uh, that allows us to configure a VPP service function so that we create the right tie to the vSwitch. Um, and this is a, a fully compliant uh, implementation. In parentheses, I would say that uh, it would be really useful for us as an OpenStack community to take into account FIDO with this kind of services and functionality and implement against that. At the moment, we limit ourselves to a subset of the data planes that are available, and therefore we are having difficulty releasing features as they almost the standard is finished, and as open source, we are not yet supporting that. Um, this is an example of what Frank was referring to earlier, where you have the different nodes in the graph, and you could see how uh, the VXLAN GPE combined with NSH processing is being plugged into the graph. This is the way a project integrates and injects itself into um, the rest of the nodes that we have on the graph, and we do not have time to go into the detail, you could find um, some of the information on the release on that pointer. Thank you, Ari. So, I'll be brief. Today's container. So, this is an example of uh, two containers talking to each other via TCP on the same machine. So, you have two paths. So, uh, the first container, that's an application, open a socket, have a send system call, go to the stack go to um, a VETH. So if this is OVS, it goes back between two, VET, uh, two OVS, another, v, um, another de device, and then back to the application. With uh, VPP today, so we have a pair of VETH that connect the dots, because uh, the advantage of VPP is being user-learned for fast development, but here you have no kernel implementation. And you will see that on paper, at least on slide, these look longer, but what are the numbers? I don't have them, they have not been published, and also this is not a very targeted use case for VPP. But people are working on that within VPP, so this one, I'll be brief. Basically, so what you try to achieve is a send and receive to go via a FIFO, and you completely bypass the TCP stack. But this assumes that you will have a lot of TCP connection between two containers, and I would say this is not very NFV, uh, centric because NV is about packet coming from a cell phone going to the internet. 
So you don't expect containers to create packets on themselves. But this, just to say that with VPP, you can research and try to solve very complex problem and go for something very complex like this. This could last for a complete presentation, but now. So we have on the right the today and tomorrow. So what I want to show is VPP is a future proof regarding container developments. What we have today, as I showed before, is legacy container being interconnected to the vSwitch, so between them and to the outside world via uh, the host kernel, via a pair of VTH port and an AF packet socket. Now, you can run DPDK-based container on top of vHost user, and you will say, but you showed me before, a vHost user is a bottleneck, but I told you that the bottleneck will be, uh, okay, we're going to optimize it drastically in the coming months, not weeks. And then if you want to go further, say, okay, vHost user, I want something even more uh, fast. So if you have VPP in the container and VPP out, you can take any shortcut that you want, apply any policy that you want, uh, because that's, you just need to have the proper node in the container, the proper node in the switch, and you can either by, even bypass the switch if you want. So just to say that there will be a lot of innovation in this field in order to have fast communication, but as there is no free lunch, if you want some uh, multi-tenancy, you will have copy, but in some cases you can optimize, okay, that's the same tenant, maybe I can. So just to say that VPP is a, is a good fit for this kind of uh, development. I'll be very quick on this one. So today, VNF developers are quite puzzled about should I go to VM, to container, mix? A lot of VMs today are big, large VM that they consume a lot of memory coming from a legacy world, but, uh, and people start to slice them into container, into VM, and I have to say I have no answer, but what I can say is VPP can handle VM containers. That's it. And then that's an orchestration issue. So whatever is the future, VPP is there for the BNF. So what we've seen is that on the production side, VPP is quite mature, despite being a very, very recent uh, project, because it has a lot of counter everywhere. Trace, documentation, training. I encourage you to go to the FIDO uh, wiki page. You have a lot of sessions which has been recording, a lot of hands-on exercise. You have a very active community. Just look at the mailing list, very open. Uh, they have open weekly call. They have a great CI, getting CI based on CC that you can put in your lab. It's still a very new project, but as soon as it will be mature enough, so what's mature enough, we'll discuss in the community, uh, we're going to have an LTS version of VPP. So good for production. And uh, the goal of FIDO community and OPNAV community is to bring OPNAV RDO integration uh, integrated by Okata, so people can go on POC with Okata OpenStack version and evaluate VPP for real, end to end in OpenStack, and give number, publish them. We'll be happy to get them in OPNAV, and OPNAV will publish numbers. On the innovation path, uh, if you want to, 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 to work on the next big thing, thanks to the portability, the modularity, the ease to add a new protocol, the sandboxing project, okay, that's a very good vehicle for innovation. And you already have a lot of cool stuff there, including containers, NSH, lists, whatever. And now, put just for Okata. So let's think about Okata. What do we need for Okata? So DPDK, properly integrated. So we, we need CentOS, DPDK people to work together. We need OpenStack, OpenDelight, Triple O integration to be in RDO. So you can install RDO properly within OPNFV and get your end-to-end -end use cases in OPNAV. And that's my last slide. Thanks for your attention. Do you have any questions? Probably have a few minutes here for questions if anyone has uh, any questions or you're all overwhelmed with the innovation, Hi. the pace of the technology. <laughs> Hi, I have uh, one small question. Uh, my name is Gal. Uh, you said, I saw that you said that uh, VPP support the uh, ARM, uh, but you also mentioned that it relies on Intel uh, vectoring instructions. So how that works together? 
It's very simple. It's portable. So you just recompile it, and uh, you have the CLIB. You have an abstraction layer. So uh, the vector is, OK, you can use the vector instruction to optimize some things, but it's different from the vector packet. The vector packet is a table of packet, if you want, in C. So it's not, it's not tightened to Intel. It's work well on Intel. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Just to, to add to that response, uh, actually, uh, for those who are not aware, uh, DPDK for quite some time, uh, while its origins are uh, clearly with Intel, is a, another open community, supports uh, multiple uh, architectures as well. Yeah. Uh, there was another question here. Okay, do you want to so, take this? So, uh, the question is, uh, what's the advantage of VPP against other vSwitches? So, uh, I would say, look at my slides. I guess that's a great framework, that's a great community, that's, uh, that's really for NFV. So, that's my answer. Uh, second one, the load balancer is under, inter you have different uh, maglev implementation ongoing for a load balancer within VPP. There is a project. So, just have a look at the mailing list and uh, you will see uh, some activity there. So for, uh, for the first question, if I may, I, I'd yeah. like to add a few more points. Uh, maybe two key points. One is uh, the direct attachment and reliance and taking advantage of um, the tight coupling to the underlying forwarding that the platform can offer to you. So that happens because VPP is a technology that has been there for a uh, long time. Its origins are uh, 2002. DPDK is also a technology that is there for multiple years. They are both mature, and they are designed for the ground up. So they are designed to take advantage of all the innovations that the CPU architecture um, can deliver and the server architecture a a as a whole. So um, what you will see is that we, we, you could think of it as we have evolution of software. As an example, software evolves from uh, client server, virtualization, containers. You have evolution of hardware. We take the hardware evolution and we uh, make that um, to be as useful as, as possible. As Frank showed earlier, well, uh, you still, the bottleneck may move as, as as we progress on the technology, but you are starting from the foundation. You are uh, relying on the best the platform can do as we clear all the bottlenecks that is supposedly going to emerge as a, as a performance leader, efficiency leader. But there is another angle, and the other angle is really um, looking at the problem more in a network-centric fashion. Um, we gave you one example of, of uh, SFC over here. Uh, there is a, a, the whole notion that as a community you could add features. Um, that comes to play in two ways. It comes to play, first of all, with the openness of the community. You could walk in and you could add a project. We are working for multiple years to add SFC to other uh, data planes. Still, it is not there. So. Um, you have richness of all the network protocols. There are other attempts in this community to get um, the network to offer a broader set of protocols um, that, as an example, NFV would, would require. This platform is designed to do that so, so you could benefit uh, from it. And these are just a just few, uh, few examples. Uh, the, other, the other maybe little note I would like to add is because things are in, in the user mode, um, you are not also dependent on the pace the kernel itself is moving. There is a give and take over there, obviously. Um, sometimes you don't need the additional performance. Sometimes you would like to use the kernel. But if you want to move faster, if you have innovation, uh, you could take advantage of that. So you want to do the full comparison. Any other question? Okay, thank you guys. Uh, hopefully that was useful. Thank you.